Hi, this is Dr. Kevin Windish from Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. Welcome to our video series for professionals. Um, we can be reached at 775-359-7111 if you'd like to schedule a rotation with us or a consultation on one of your patients. Uh, today what we want to talk about are functional bowel disorders in children. And again, this is really designed for medical professionals in training. Um, so let's go ahead and get going. So functional bowel disorders in children come with uh, a tremendous amount of variety. Functional fecal retention and constipation represents the vast majority of what we see. However, functional bowel pain, functional bowel pain with altered motility and cyclic vomiting are also uh, things that we see. We'll talk a little bit about these. We'll, we'll come back to these at the end of the lecture. Uh, it's important with constipation to have a good differential diagnosis because it's too easy to get tunnel vision and to miss other pathologies. So we want to take a minute and look at our differential diagnosis here. It is long. The vast majority of this is functional. However, sacral tumors can do it, Hirschsprung's disease, malrotation, chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction, which will present with also some bladder difficulties. So uh, either urinary retention or lead pipe leaking of the, the bladder. Child abuse. Now, in the realm of general pediatrics, child abuse is a result causing functional fecal retention is rare. However, if you talk to people who work in the field of child abuse, a number of their patients will be constipated for any of a number of reasons. Uh, the constipation that they see is rarely a result of anal penetration, but rather more of a result of behavioral changes um, as a coping mechanism for their constipation. But while all squares are rectangles, not all rectangles are squares, and in the world of general pediatrics, most constipation is functional, not resulting from child abuse. Ectopic anus and anal stenosis uh, definitely show up on the list, though they are quite rare and something that I don't have on this list, but it's important to remember. Spinal dysraphisms, specifically tethered cord. Uh, and then functional dyskesia of the newborn, that straining for stooling for a newborn, it is functional, it is normal. If the stool's not hard, that is not constipation, yet they may present to your office with a chief complaint of constipation, and many novice providers mistakenly think they're dealing with constipation. For the remainder of this lecture, we really want to concentrate on constipation in uh, toddlers and school-age children and even teens, but we want to stay away from constipation of the newborns. I do have a different lecture on that topic on YouTube, and you're certainly welcome to view that at a later date, but that's not what we want to discuss here today, now. So physical exam, it's important to do a thorough exam. <clears throat> Abdominal palpation for hard stool is very important. Look at the external, external genitalia and the anus. Lots of people never take the time to look, and if you never look, you miss all sorts of things. Rarely do you need to do a digital rectal exam, and in fact, I would discourage you from doing one unless there's a uh, uh, pressing reason to do that, because these kids already have control issues, and taking away that control is just going to make things worse. Look at lower extremity DTRs. This will help you rule out sacrococcygeal tumors, as well as tethered cord. Look at the feet for high arches. Again, this will look help you to rule out tethered cord and um, uh, sacrococcygeal tumors. Therapy for this. <clears throat> high fiber diet. Most of these kids' fi diets are devoid of fiber. Uh, we define a high fiber diet as age plus 5 grams of fiber, so a 5 year old needs 10 grams of fiber, maxing out at about 20 years of age, so maxing out at about 25 grams of fiber a day. Time toileting. Many of these children are too busy to sit on the toilet. If the child is toilet trained, they should sit on the toilet 5 minutes after breakfast, 5 minutes after dinner to take advantage of the gastrocolic reflex and to make sure that they take the time to stool because many of them are just too busy. And then clean out. And the regimen I use the most is polyethylene glycol. Uh, we clean the kids out with between one and a half to two grams per kilo per day. <clears throat> 
and once we've cleaned them out, usually we do three to five days for clean out, then we maintain them on one gram per kilo per day, so roughly half the original dose. Um, sometimes this is ineffective, and we'll look at some alternative regimens in a second. Um, and you want to maintain them on polyethylene glycol uh, for about six months while the intestines heal and shrink back down to a normal size, and then you can um, do a trial off. And if they back up, do it over again. I recommend avoiding, if at all humanly possible, enema suppositories and digital disimpaction. Again, these kids have lots of control issues, and these things take control away from the children. Now, while we look at these references for a minute, let's talk about um, some alternative regimens when this does not work. So, first of all, if you have a kid who has a history of constipation from early infancy or who has a delayed passage of meconium uh, or who just fails clean out, with uh, Miralax polyethylene glycol, then the next step is to image the intestines, make sure they're normal, make sure that there's not Hirschsprung's disease. Use gastrographin when you do this, don't use barium, because barium will concretize in there. The gastrographin being water soluble, however, will affect a clean out for you, so that will get what you need, although that's an expensive way to clean a child out. It definitely does it, and it's diagnostic at the same time. Some other alternative regimens, uh, if the child won't take Miralax, or again, if the Miralax was ineffective, uh, you can try magnesium sulfate, or I'm sorry, magnesium citrate, um, one bottle daily for two to three days. You do need to be careful about hypermagnesemia in there, and so the smaller the child, the more ginger you need to be with that medication. Um, enemas will get you a quick at least starting clean out, but they're something I would reserve as a last resort when nothing else works or when you have a large dilated colon um, that you see on gastrograph and enema if nothing else is, is working to clean the child out. Um, do be careful if you're using enemas because of the risk of hyperphosphatemia if you're using Fleet's Phosphosoda, and I'd recommend against warm water or soap suds enemas because of the risk of hyponatremia. Um, in children with redundant sigmoids or large dilated colons, um, Senna works very well. And so that's an alternative, and we just titrate the Senna to effect as well, sometimes combining that with the uh, polyethylene glycol. And Senna comes in some palatable formulations. Uh, some other alternatives that are useful if we need it, milk of magnesia, although that causes a lot of cramping, and um, I wouldn't use that for maintenance, but again, for clean-out, it will, it will affect a clean-out for you. And lactulose. Uh, but again, that causes a lot of can cramping and gas, and so the kids don't particularly like it. And there's some palatability issues, but again, that's an alternative that's open to you. So these are some resources for you, and we're actually going to back up here to some of the other functional disorders. So we're going to start from the bottom. Cyclic vomiting. Um, Cyclic vomiting, whether cyclic vomiting and um, abdominal migraine are one and the same or not is a matter of great debate and outside of the scope of this lecture. Um, for a moment, let's just say that my, my propensity is to say that they're actually very different. And the patients with cyclic vomiting tend to have a lot of psychosocial gain from the vomiting. Uh, and a lot of stress in their lives that the kids with abdominal migraines don't necessarily have. Also, the kids with abdominal migraines, from my experience, tend to vomit uh, regularly, but not, not like the kids with cyclic vomiting, where you'll see them vomit 50 times in an hour. Uh, so just tremendous, profuse vomiting that comes on very suddenly. Um, Cyclic vomiting responds nicely to a combination of tricyclic antidepressants and biofeedback and hypnosis. Same thing for functional bowel pain. Now, I do everything in the book to avoid tricyclics, including usually trying something like uh, 
non-activating SSRIs, so Zoloft, but when that fails, Elevil, Amitriptyline goes a long way for helping, but then most definitely combining that with hypnosis and biofeedback to help to get the children off the medication, because less is always more, and there's all kinds of side effects from tricyclics, and if we can avoid them, we're just always better off. Plus, a lot of functional bowel disorders come from a sensation of lack of control. We talked about that in constipation. So the hypnosis and biofeedback to help increase a sense of mastery and a sense of control both over your bowels, over your abdomen, over your sensation, and over your life in general goes a long way. This can either be done with a psychotherapist trained in biofeedback or a physician trained in biofeedback such as my, and hypnosis such as myself. These children many times have a lot of chaos in their life and some family therapy also goes a long way to helping with this. So, um, you know, I think of this as a three-legged stool. Uh, the first leg being medication therapy, the second leg being behavioral therapy, and the last leg being psychotherapy. The psychotherapy being done by a psychotherapist or a family and behavioral therapist. But the behavioral therapy can come from general pediatrics if you're trained in, in uh, biofeedback and or hypnosis. Um, or from, um, from uh, uh, a psychotherapist trained in that. If you're not familiar with biofeedback and hypnosis, let me just say uh, I strongly recommend you utilize a therapist trained by the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. Those therapists will either be, psych will either be licensed psychotherapists or licensed physicians uh, licensed in their, their given discipline, so general pediatrics or developmental pediatrics or gastroenterology, or they may be nurse practitioners or physician's assistants, but they are licensed healthcare professionals who have obtained additional training in hypnosis as opposed to a lay hypnotherapist or a lay hypnotist who may or may not know anything about bowel disorders and constipation and may or may not have ever treated a child uh, and may or may not know anything about psychology um, because there are some issues with that uh, more limited training. Um, the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis, www.ash.net, can help you find an ASH certified physician in your area um, to help with the behavioral training. Um, these can be frustrating disorders, although I will tell you when you learn how to help the patients, you know, the constipation in particular needs a lot of med management, but uh, with the others, if you, when you learn good behavioral management skills and can teach that to the patient, along with reining in some of the familial chaos, uh, you can really make a huge difference in these kids' lives without any side effects. And with, in, a, in a way, medication does not, because medicine's not particularly effective um, for functional bowel pain or um, functional bowel pain with altered motility. Some of the irritable, there are some newer irritable bowel drugs on the market that you'll see marketed. They are not currently FDA approved, nor are they recommended for use in children. Uh, as somebody who does a ton of off-label prescribing, I will tell you, I still don't recommend their use in children, not by me, not by my students, and not by anybody at this point in time. Now, that is a chapter, you know, open to be rewritten as we have more experience with these drugs, but um, for the time being, they're, they're not something that we'd recommend in children. And, um, again, there are some viable alternatives with biofeedback and hypnosis. So, if we can be of assistance, please feel free to call our office, 775-359-7111. If you're a parent watching this, please realize we can't treat your child over the internet or over the telephone, and this discussion is not intended to replace consultation with a physician. Um, if you'd like us to see your child or your patient, um, either for hypnosis, biofeedback, or management of functional fecal retention, uh, We'll be happy to help you. Give us a call.